Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. When Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he goes, guys, I want to know those who are talking so arrogantly like it doesn't matter that I'm in sin. It doesn't matter if I live ungodly. I want to know not their words. I want to know the power. Is the power there? Now, if you had Paul saying that to you and you knew his background, I don't know, but you'd be like, straighten up. Time to straighten up before Paul gets here, you know? But as we're going to see next week, Paul's going to say, listen, as to this fellow has done this sin and taken his father's wife, I've already judged him as if I was there. I've already said, now he says, we're not here to judge. You know, the Bible teaches very clearly, we are not here to judge anyone. And, 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 and by the way, in this very letter, in 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to see, who's the one person we're responsible for judging? Yourself. In fact, it says don't even take communion till you first judge yourself. Call your sin what it is, sin. But in the church, he says, you're not supposed to have the people that are living in sin and saying it's okay with God, because it's not. And the church has become really watery in our, in our existence. We don't, we don't want to call sin, sin. Might step on someone's toes. But listen, if some guy is taking his father's wife to bed and going to church and saying it's okay, do you think it reflects on the rest of the body at all? Cause any troubles for anyone else? Paul says, listen, I've judged the guy that that's not right. You need to discipline him. You need to take him, tell him to get out of the church, to, uh, break off the sin. Now, those of you that know church history, does the church at Corinth hear Paul's words in this matter? Do they tell the guy, hey, you know, knock it off or get out? What's the answer? Anyone know? The answer is yes, they do. And they do such a good job, they put the guy out, they're like, he's dead to us. We're not talking to him at all. And the guy, it, it's a wake-up call to him. He repents. He repents, and Paul has to write 2 Corinthians, the next letter of your Bible, just to point out, guys, you did a good job putting him out. But he repented. Now what are you supposed to do? Bring him back in. You, you know, the whole purpose of discipline is to get someone in line. But they were so, oh, <laughs> I could just see it. We kicked them out. We did a good job. Paul, be proud. And the guy repents. They're like, too bad. We're the righteous ones. You're not. Kicked you out. Paul's like, yeah, messed up again. And he has to write Second Corinthians to tell him, get the guy back in the fellowship. The the point of discipline is to get you in line. Once you're in line, get back in and stay there. Yeah. But see, it's just part of the whole thing. Paul's like, I'm not here to tell you the words. I'm here to tell you the power. The power of God. How many of you would like to have that kind of power of God demonstrated in your life? That, that they would find out that you're coming and they go, put the sick people on that side of the road so that your shadow would touch them. Or that they just take your handkerchief just to... Some of you go, I don't have a hanky. Okay, a Kleenex, whatever. Anything you touched. Your coffee cup. They got your Starbucks cup. Look, it's got a lipstick. I'm sure she touched it. She got the power of God. Here, touch this cup. How many believe God could do that, by the way? Just, just, sure. What's the difference? The thing was that it was that he had touched it, and they knew it, and they thought... This guy has the power of God. And they were looking for that cure from God. You know, we have a starving world that is hurting for a touch from our maker. And some of you are the vessel that God wants to use for his touch to flow through. You, you've got neighbors just sitting there in pain. And God's going, I just need you to go over and touch them. Just, just a touch. It's okay. It's not going to hurt you. They don't got cooties. He's just going to be a vessel of my mercy to touch them. Because God does, 
you know, does God want to touch us? I don't know if you guys know the story about Jesus and the, and the leper that came to him. And, you know, were you supposed to touch a leper? I mean, remember the lepers had to stay on the other side of the road and pull even their robes tight to them so that not even the edge of their robe would flap and, and touch some passerby. And they had to cry out if they saw someone coming, unclean, unclean, stay away from me, I have leprosy. And when Jesus has someone with leprosy come to him, what does he do? I love this part. I mean, some people, they, I don't know the key in on, I always like the details of the Bible. Because it says he touched he touched them. I said, be well. The very, if you were a leper and you hadn't had any contact from anybody. See, I'm raised Italian. That would kill me. We are not raised where we do not touch. You know, we get up, we get hugged in the morning from mom, dad, all the whole family. Hugs and kisses. Then it's time to go to the bathroom. And then go to breakfast. And then more hugs and kisses. And then it's time to go to the school. And then more hugs and kisses before you leave. And... This is normal. Do you think, I mean, our society, we have some people have no, they never get any love. And here's Jesus with a leper who hasn't been allowed to be touched by anyone. And what's he do? Touches them and says, be well. And they're made well. But I don't think they were just made well physically of the leprosy. I think there was a whole other part of their being that just needed that, that contact, that human touch. And Jesus went, let me show you what I do for those that are hurt. I mean, even the sick. Paul, he laid hands on the sick. They recovered. How, how many of you have ever prayed for someone that's sick and seen God answer? Just cool things that he does, you know. It's just, he, did God quit his job? No. He's still in the business of touching lives. And you know, the beauty is he's willing to use vessels like us to do his handiwork. Paul said, just two chapters ago, don't you know that your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost? God put his spirit in you. Why? Because now you're a portable container for the spirit of God to go touch people's lives. And the power of God can touch their lives just through a simple gesture. Just through a touch. Just through a hug. Just, to, just that practical God loves you. It's real. It's really, and it can, it can do such great things. But, but we have a culture that says, I don't know if those things are even around, around anymore. Maybe God doesn't have his power. Maybe he turned off the switch. I remind them what the scripture says in Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Always the same. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. Even to the ends of the age, I am with you. I'll never leave you, and I'll never what? Forsake you. If he says he's never going to leave me, and he's never going to forsake me, and he says, I don't worry, I go to my father's house, don't be troubled. In my Father's house, many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you get to be with me also. And, and don't worry about it because I'm going to send a comforter and he's going to be with you. And who is the comforter? The Holy Spirit. Now, did Jesus say he's only staying for a while? So only the first few guys in the church get him and then the rest, good luck? Because that's what some churches are teaching today. That the Holy Ghost was around back then for the first guys, but sorry, we're down line. We don't get any. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The devil wants you to believe that because the devil doesn't want you to know about the power of God's Spirit. Because once you know about the power, you're going to upset the apple cart. I mean, you're going to start helping people. And the power of God might work through you. And boy, that'll mess up everybody. You're like, oh no, Izzy's got God's Spirit's on him, you know, power starting to flow. Uh-oh. Do you think the devil's happy that we have God's spirit? Gives a standing ovation. Yay! Good job. You got the spirit. He hates it. But how many of you could stand just like Paul and say, 
don't worry. What I'm talking about, I don't need to tell you by words. I'll show you by the power. Yeah, I personally have experienced the power of God. And it's not my power. I can tell you that. I am certain it's not me. Because I can't do the stuff he can do. I had the privilege of putting my hands on a man's knee that was blown out by, by a, a, a beam that swung into his high-rise metal worker in, in Arizona. And it tore all the ligaments away. It tore the muscle away from the back of his, where attached here at the back of the knee. And his calf muscle pulled down because they're attached here and here. And so his calf muscle was in a ball at the back of his, of his Achilles heel. And it was like, looked like a baseball stuck. And then the weird part was, I never seen this until that day, that once you pull the muscle out of the way, you know what you see from the back? Bones. You actually can see them back there because there's no muscle covering it up. And this guy could take his leg and go Beep, this way and this way and that way. It was completely destroyed. He had to wear a brace. One leg all beefy from nine years of walking, covering for this leg, dragging it. Big old iron worker. Had had prayer over and over and over. And he's like, I guess God just doesn't want to heal me. I go, well, do you mind if I pray? I mean, the pastor said just do it. And how do we know? Maybe today's the day. You know, maybe God wants to do something. And, and, and I was always complaining, Lord, I get to lead everyone to you, but I never see your power. I want to see your power. Not that any young Christian would ever complain, right? Me, me, me. No, goes, okay, put your hands on it. Kneel down. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I knelt down. And you know when the, that little voice in your head says, do it, and you know you should do it? What are you supposed to do right then? You do it. Somebody asked me, how come it happened for you? Well, you're going to think this is a little too simplified, but... When the little voice of God's Spirit goes, do this. The trick to seeing the power is obey the voice of the Spirit. So I knelt down. And I put my hands on this guy's knee. And I could feel the bones under the skin. There was no muscle. The bone was hanging. It was gross. The bottom bones were not attached. It was not good. And nine years he had suffered with this. And the Lord said, pray for him. And I have a friend, Clark, he was from our early Calvary Chapel, Verde Valley there. He was standing up, had his hands on his shoulder, was praying, and I'm down there praying. And I remember praying. I can tell you what I actually prayed if you want to know the secret prayer. <laughs> Lord, I, who am I? I'm nothing, man. Just forgive me my sin and get me out of the way, and you do what you got to do, man. Your power is the only thing that could fix this. This guy's leg is jacked up. I mean, it is bad. And while I was praying that, this old lady, Claire, came up from behind me and touched me right between my shoulder blades. And she, she was praying with us. And I felt this hot sensation, like electric, like warm, warm electricity, shoot down both my arms into my hands. And right in my hands, the man's calf muscle reattached. And the, and the muscles all attached and his knee went Ooh. and sucked together. And he, I went, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. And he looked down at me like, what did you do? With shock. And then he, and he's a big guy, and I was a little guy. And he looked down, and he stomped his leg, and he pushed it, tried to push it back, it didn't pop. Push it this way, it didn't pop. Push it that Jumped up, he started jumping up and down really hard, with just full force. A couple hundred pound man, beefy. And all of a sudden, the leg that was skinny was all of a sudden restored to the size of the other leg in my hand. He stomps, he stomps, and then he just looks up, and he just starts tears flowing down his face. Thank you, Jesus. It's like he left the room. Forget everyone else. I don't care what you think, guys. Jesus, thank you. His leg was restored. I'm like, could I get your phone number? I never had this happen before. Where do you work? You know, you're an iron worker. I grew up in construction here. My dad works for Union Rock Benson Contracting, big contractor. Where's your, you're with what company? Okay. You guys are going to think I'm so spiritual. Like, I'm so spiritual. I called the next day to his work job site and said, is so-and-so there, this um, guy that, you know, he's got a brace on his knee. And the guy, the foreman, he goes, 
Oh, man. Blankety blank blank. That guy, I don't know what to do with him. He had a brace on his knee. His, his knee was bad. I mean, his leg was so messed up. His calf muscles at the back. He's telling me all this stuff. And then he went to some church holy meeting thing, and some young kid put his hand on his knee, and his knee is all, I mean, his whole leg is like it's put back the way it's supposed to be, and he didn't have any surgery, and I don't have a form for this because he's a union guy, and I, he's grounded, and I don't know how I'm supposed to put him, and he wants to be back up on the high rise today, and he's telling me I have to put him on the high rise again, and, and the whole reason he's not on the high rise is because he has his knee jacked up, but his knee's not jacked up. I don't know what to do with him. By the way, who is this? I'm the little guy that prayed for him. Oh, sorry about the swearing. <laughs> never heard it. Grew up in construction my whole life. I'm like, ne never heard that. But okay. I say, well, when he comes in, could you have him call me? And I knew right then it really did happen. You know, like sometimes you just wonder, did it really just happen? I mean, that really happened. And God used it for a testimony. And God used it for a testimony to me to shut up and quit complaining because I thought it was a bad thing that all I ever got to do was lead people to Jesus. I never got to see the real miracles. And the Lord said, what's a bigger miracle, that they get saved or that they get their leg well? And I realized, oh yeah, I guess that saved thing is bigger. But, but then he goes, yeah, it's all right, I'll use you for the other thing whenever I need to. And since then, I've seen his hand use me to pray for people that were in wheelchairs and they've gotten restored from being paralyzed and being raised up. We prayed for a lady sitting right where our brother's over there at the table right there in blue. There was a, a lady in a wheelchair that came here from some islands way out towards the Marshall Islands out there in the Pacific, and she was paralyzed from the waist down. Prayed for her after service, and I felt like that same feeling. It's hard to explain, but that feeling of, uh-oh, my hands are getting warm and tingly, and I can't make this turn on. I wish I knew where the switch was, but I know who has the switch, and I know when he wants to do it, because it's usually when I don't feel like even doing it, like, man, I'm already tired, Lord, can we just go home, and the lady wants prayer, and hey, guys, come over here, let's pray, come on, Daniel, come over here, Jason, come over here, Lord, I just pray for this lady, and as I'm praying, I, my, uh oh, my hands are getting warm, Dan, get your hand in here, I wanted to show my son what it feels like, and I turned to Jason Brewer, I said, you know, I, I, I can tell God's Spirit's touching this woman. I, I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. I didn't even, she couldn't speak English. Well, I don't know if you can understand this, but God's Spirit is touching you, and He's going to heal you. I can tell. And she's just nodding. And she left. And she went to the airport, and she had to be brought to the, you know, our plane, we don't have ramps and stuff like that. So she had to be brought to the, to the jetway, and then they had this little scissor jack thing that lifts you up. And they were lifting her up, and they got her up to the top of the thing to, to get into the thing. And she's in her wheelchair, and she looks down, and her legs grew, right? And they were, oh, I forgot to tell you. They were a person who had never walked. You know how they got that skin and bone disease? No muscle. Like big knees, knobby, little skinny bone here, little skinny bones here, big ankles. You know, like, because without the muscle, it, does, it looks different. And she was sitting in the scissor jack going up, and her legs grew in. <laughs> and she started, she got up at the top, she's jumping up and down, going, let me go, let me go. And they go, you already passed security, lady, get in the plane. You're holding up the whole rest of the line, you know. And they made her get in the plane. And I didn't know anything about it. I was like, totally clueless. Just thought, that was a long day at work today, Lord. A couple years go by. She's gone back to her islands, and she shared what God did at our little church here on the beach. A family, a couple islands over, saved up their money for three and a half years so they could come here because they heard there's some crazy preacher who preaches from the Bible, and he prays for people at the end. And so there's three generations, grandpa, father, and son, come with their grandchild. There's four generations, but three of them are all, they have this progressively crippling disease. And so grandpa's in a wheelchair paralyzed from about here down. The father, it's come through his legs up to his hips. And the son, it's in his legs and he's dragging. He's got one of those walkers and he's able to drag himself like this. And they all work themselves from there to that table. <laughs> Same spot. And they sit there and they go, is this the place where the guy teaches the Bible like verse by verse? 
and um and and then they pray at the end and someone told me yeah that's the guy right there and good we want to meet him please and the and the grandchild was the interpreter for the family because none of them spoke english and that's how i found out about the lady being healed Oh, you prayed for someone like three and a half years ago. This lady, she had skinny legs, and she got healed on the top of the thing, and she wanted to come back to tell you, but they said no, so she just flew home, and then the word spread because they heard about our family because we all have this problem. So we've saved our money to come here, so can you pray for us? No pressure. None at all. You did what? You saved for three and a half years? Yeah, I'm thinking in my mind. You know there are Christians over there somewhere, I'm sure, much closer. Why aren't they using the power of God in their area? Because I don't have the exclusive on this. I mean, God's power is available to all of you. You know this, right? It's like all of us can have his power from the Spirit, not me alone. He, he, he's an equal opportunity God here. But they came all the way. And I'm thinking, Lord... Everybody had dug out. It was me and Wally Dolan. We were the last two guys. I'm like, Wally, the little kid just told me how come they've been waiting all this time. And I just thought they wanted to have lunch or something. And, and they're all in wheelchairs and stuff. And <laughs> Wally says, well, guess the Lord has an appointment. And we go over there and we pray. And I, I felt like the Lord said, start with the elders, you know, start with the oldest guy first. Didn't really feel anything. Went to the dad. Seemed like he's like maybe a few years older than me. And when I did, I could feel, uh-oh, I felt this before. Hey, Wally, guess what? I think he's doing something. Wally's just nodding. Come on, let's hurry up. We got to go. Pray for him. Pray for his son, the one that was dragging with the little walker. And when I put my hands on that boy, I knew, uh-oh, it's all over. I felt this. That's the same feeling when I had my hand on that guy's knee. He's doing the same thing right when I'm touching this young man. Maybe his 20s, mid-20s. I'm like, know this one. Son, I don't know if you can understand me. Could you interpret to your dad or your uncle, whoever this is? Just tell him that I know God's spirit is touching. The power of God, just like he touched that lady, is touching him right now. And the kid told him, and I looked at him and said, do you, do, can you feel that? And he just looked at me. I said, no words are necessary. You know, when God's power is moving, you don't really need words. He's just looking at me like, well, he goes, okay, time to go. Trailer's all packed up. The guy's got it all bungeed. Everything's ready to riot. Let's go. We get in. I turn around. That, there's the rig right there. I turn it this way. And I start to go, and I, Wally's ahead of me, and I look back, and the boy is throwing the thing in the air and running after me. And the dad, who was in the wheelchair, has jumped up and is running after his son and yells at his son, and I'm watching in my mirror this happen. And the son goes, Dad, and runs back, and they hug, and they're just, just like looking at their legs and standing and jumping, and they're waving to me, and the Lord goes, Don't stop. I was like, oh. I, I, I call Wally on the cell. He's right in front of me. Wally, look back in your mirror. The, by now, they've made it into the runway, and they're jumping up and down, waving. And then the Lord said, just wave. You don't need, God doesn't need glory grabbers. He, he, you know, he does his job. And when he did that, Wally just went, oh, good thing we waited. Because he was like, <laughs> it was one of those days, you know, when church went too long already and you just want to get home and why don't they get over with this? And it's kind of cool when God's power shows up. I don't, I always wonder, why does he wait to the end sometimes, you know? You know, do you ever notice that? Have, have any of you ever seen God move and he, like, they call it afterglows, yeah. you know? Like the service is over and after things all done and most of the folks have gone home, there's a few people left and all of a sudden God's power shows up and miracles happen and people go, why didn't I stick around? Like, I don't know. One thing I learned about the Lord though, he doesn't care about our ability. He just cares about our availability. 
Are we willing to be used? Lord, I'm here. Send me. Use me. And you know, I know Paul experienced the power of God just like I'm talking about. And he knew God's power is awesome. You know, when God's power delivers someone from a demon, when God's power heals someone from a sickness, an incurable illness, and he touches them, and that person's life is just, I mean, impacted. Like, you just, you, guys, it's a really cool feeling. And Paul wasn't like, hey, I want to have a theological debate with you when I get there. He said, you guys are arrogant. I want to see who has the power when I get there. Because he knew the power. Christians have forgotten about God's power. We, we, we've actually made God like he's powerless. He can't really do that anymore. We have a theological teaching that says he doesn't operate in any of those gifts anymore. Gifts of healing, they don't happen. Didn't you know that was for the early church? And did, I'm like, when? Where was, the, where was the decree that the Spirit quit his job? I want to know. I've been reading this book for 35 years. I can't find the verse. In fact, I know it's not in here because I've read every single verse. I've taught every single chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the entire, from Genesis to Revelation to this church, took 15 years. There is not a verse in here that says, God's Spirit only will work in the early days. And then he quits. So I'm here to tell you, he's still alive and well. And if you need a touch from that, what I'm talking about, you need God's power to help you. Maybe you need God's power to deliver you from a, a bad habit. Maybe you just, you know, just need him to give you the power over that addiction. Can he do that? Do you know how many people I have prayed for that I've seen delivered from LSD or Coke or, you know, well, we got a new word, but speed and crank and meth and cigarettes they tell me they're the worst do you think god has enough power to deliver someone from addiction because the god i serve does it all the time one prayer lord deliver me and you know what he does he hears their prayer would you join me let's pray father thank you so much for the power that you have a power that can set us free from the worst of the worst sins and I just pray, Father, that anyone who is hearing this, that perhaps this is new news to them, that you have power. Lord, I pray that you would touch them with your power. That sweet, delivering power that, that frees us from the bondages of the flesh and, and opens up our eyes that we can serve you in newness of life in the Spirit. I pray this morning for our dear brother, and Sister Sandy, that you are going to be joined to your son now in the waters of baptism, that you would give them the power, your spirit's power, for any of the things that they need, Lord. And for all of us, Lord, we want you to pour out your power on us. We could be a light to this generation, to those in need. Give us your power. Anyone that agrees with me, I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you join? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.